Well, good morning, Grant Memorial. It is uh, great to be with you on this summer morning in August. Uh, you know how I know it's August? The Jets game last night, right? Classic August. <laughs> So strange, isn't it? Uh, But hey, hockey is on again, and so I'm not complaining. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, or for the first time in a while, we have, as a church, been walking through the Old Testament book of Psalms, which are a collection of songs sung by God's people for thousands of years. And these songs provide vocabulary for us to come before God honestly in every season with every emotion no matter where we happen to be and to join the entire history of God's people using these words to ask questions of, to declare truth about, and to converse with God himself. So would you turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Psalm 139 as we do just that this morning. And as I uh, always say, if you're not sure where the Psalms are, open your Bible to about the midway point and you will either be in or very close to the Psalms. We're starting, uh, we're reading today from Psalm 139. This is what it says. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and we pray today as we dig into it that, uh, that we would learn about you, that we would see better about ourselves and ultimately, Lord, that our lives would be changed as a result of meeting with you and pondering your word. Amen. So this psalm that we find ourselves in today Uh, is a relatively familiar psalm. If if you've spent uh, any time at all in the church, you have likely, uh, you at least likely recognized some of the phrases that we read in the text this morning. But the reason I chose this psalm this morning is not because it's familiar, but because it teaches us about who God is. 
It, it gives us the vocabulary to praise God, to, to declare his attributes, and to ensure that we have a proper understanding of God, which is imperative if we are to approach him at all. You see, one caution that we need to remind ourselves of when we approach Scripture the way that we have been in this series, focusing on emotion and exploring our approach before God, is the tendency that we have to make ourselves the main character in each text that we read. That, that, that our focus is on ourselves as we dig into the scriptures. Who we are, what our circumstances are, how I am feeling, how he answers me, what encouragement I am to find in the scripture. Which, which are all good and appropriate things. They're good things to explore. However, we must always remember that the Bible is about God. He is the main character. And our primary goal in coming to the scriptures is to learn about him. The Bible is not a self-help book. Although it certainly gives us insights into living lives in line with our purpose. The Bible is not a feel-good, inspirational, hallmark story although it can certainly provide encouragement for us. The, the Bible is not a biography about me or you, although it does provide a mirror by which we see ourselves. No, the Bible is primarily about God. The Bible is the way that we come to know who the God of the universe is what he is like, his character, what he loves, what he hates, and how he operates in the world. And even sections of scripture like the Psalms, like this Psalm in particular that are deeply personal, emotional, and participatory are still primarily about God and exist to point us to him, to direct our gaze from the end of our own nose and to fix our eyes on the unmatchable, undefinable, unexplainable, holy God that was and is and is to come. It is only when we know who God is that we can receive any comfort from his presence, any help from his power, any encouragement from his promises, and any hope from his salvation. Theologian uh, A.W. Tozer begins his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, with these words. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let's read that again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He goes on. It is my opinion that the current Christian conception of God is so utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God and actually to constitute for professed believers something accounting to a moral calamity. How we think about God matters. Our tendency is to demote God as we raise ourselves up, as we fix our eyes on ourselves. Our tendency is to demote God, to humanize him, to domesticate him, to reduce God to, to a kind of grandfather who can't say no to his grandchildren rather than all-powerful, holy, unchanging, unnameable, I am. And in doing so, we lose the fear the wonder, the respect, the awe, and even the gift of coming before God who can and will meet us where we are, wherever that may be. And while statements like, I am fearfully and wonderfully made that we read in Psalm 139 tempt us to read ourselves as the focal point, we need to remember it is the creator, not the created, that is the focus, that is the real main character. And we actually take way more from the text, even about ourselves, if we let it speak first to who God is, rather than making each verse an anecdote about us. As you heard through the words of this psalm, these words are intensely intimate, but the intimacy is only understood properly when we have a good grasp of the one who is intimate with us. 
And David knows this. That knowledge of God comes first and that declaring who God is is what makes anything else significant. And so he pens this theological psalm. I'm not sure if you read it that way, but Psalm 139 is a theological psalm that declares who God is. Is so that the people of God would never forget the wonder of the one that they're singing to. What David does and what we'll be doing as we're looking at Psalm 139 is exploring the nature of God as found in the psalm. And what I've come to realize as I studied this psalm, looking closely at what it tells us about God, is that this is what I call the omni psalm. The omni psalm. This psalm breaks down for us the five omnis of God. And if you don't know what omni means, it simply means all. That God is all something. You'll see as we go. And for some of you thinking, I only know of three omnis. Well, you're about to be given more vocabulary to praise our amazing God. So the first omni that David declares about God in this psalm is that God is omniscient. God is omniscient. Uh, now, omni, scient, look closely. Does that ending remind you of anything? Science, right? God is omni, science. Now, what is science? Science is simply Knowledge, the, the body of knowledge around any given subject. So earth science is the study and subsequent knowledge claims about the earth. Or sports science is the knowledge surrounding sports and, and how they work and what happens. Right? Omni means all. Science means knowledge. So omniscience literally means all knowing. All knowledge. God is all knowing. There is nothing that God does not know. Contrary to popular belief, science is not pitted against God as opposed to him like some other power or competing viewpoint. Science or knowledge in its completed form, in its fullness with everything known, nothing left to be questioned, every proper answer to every question is God is God's knowledge. God is science completed, finished, fully known. There is not a field of study that God is not the foremost expert in. There's not a fact that God has yet to discover. There's not a day that God is not mindful of, an event that God is not aware of, nor is there a thought that God is not privy to. God is omniscience. He is all Knowing And listen to how David points this out to us in Psalm 139, starting at verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Not only is God capable of understanding all uh, public knowledge, like subjects and details, but David points out that God has intimate, intricate knowledge too. He knows our every action Verses 2 and 3. He knows our every thought and the motives behind them. Verse 3 and 4. Listen to what the rest of scripture says about this. 1 John 3.20 says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Hebrews 4.13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. First Chronicles 28, 9 says, The Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. God knows all things. Now, why is this important? Right? Who, who cares? Well, it's important, first of all, because it shows us the magnitude of God 
And it reminds us that we've come to the right place when we come to him. We do not serve a God who does not have all of the information. We do not follow a God who may be ill-informed. We do not call upon a God who is caught off guard, who's not in the loop or who's not woke enough to know the implications of what he's doing. So when it comes to how we relate to God, how we come before him in any and every season, we can be confident that he already knows what concerns us and even more that he knows what is best. That he knows what is best for us. Church, God knows all and God knows best. Turn to the person that you're sitting with and tell them that. God knows all God knows best. As God says in Isaiah 55, 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In concluding all of this, uh, that God knows all and God knows best, David rightly concludes in verse 6 that such knowledge is too much. Right? It's too wonderful. I cannot understand it nor attain it myself, he says. Church, if we come before God and begin with that statement alone, God is too wonderful for me. I will never be God and I will submit to him. We will find ourselves with the perfect posture before him. The second omni that David addresses in this song about God is that God is omnipresent. Omni, all, present, present. Uh, God is everywhere, right? There is nowhere that God is not. Look at what David says, starting in verse 7. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in, the word here is sheol, which is like the, after, the, the, the negative afterlife or hell, right? If I make my bed in the depths of sheol, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle at the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me the, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. Did you catch all that? Height, depth, time, realm. There is no restriction to God's presence. He is omni. He is everywhere. Right? David says there's nowhere we could go or find ourselves where God is not and has not been before. And the rest of scripture is consistent in teaching this. In Jeremiah 23, 24, God says, who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them? Do I not fill heaven and earth? Right? Trying to hide from God or keep something from him is like playing hide and seek with a baby. Right? Or a toddler. What do they do? They, they just cover their own eyes and think that you can't see them. Church. God can see behind our covered faces. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. High and low, God is present. When we're in the mountains or the valleys, God is there. So again, we ask, why is this important? And again, we respond because we need to know how vast God is, that there are no limits to his presence. And while we take up but, but feet and inches of the universe, God permeates it all. On just a theological level, this should put us in our place when we're tempted to consider ourselves to be at God's level. Or, or that we're the main character, or my opinion is somehow better than God's, that, that I'm the real important one or the real impressive one. Right, friends, I can't even get into a Best Buy after closing hours. 
let alone exist across the expanse of earth and sky. Galaxy to galaxy, atom to atom. God is the impressive one, not me. Right? Beyond that, when we think about our approach, our call to approach God, we know that we can come before him with the confidence that that he's not only with us when we talk to him, but he's with us wherever we go from there. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now one thing it's important to point out is that his presence is not simply passive. Right? God is active in his presence. Verse 10 says God guides us and holds us fast. God doesn't just see or exist everywhere, but he is sovereign everywhere. Church, we will never find ourselves in a circumstance where God is not present, where God is not sovereign, where God is not active, where God has not gone before us. God is omnipresent. The third omni that David presents in Psalm 139 is one that you may not have heard before. It is the omnificence of God. God is omnificent. Now this omni is a little less known, but it means unlimited in creative power. Right? God is all creative or all creating So jumping off the thought that God is sovereign and in control everywhere, David examines the work of his hands. What is it that he does when he's present? Telling himself, as commentator David Kidner states, God not only sees the invisible and penetrates the inaccessible, he is operative there, the author of every detail of my being. Let's look at verse 13 to 18. David says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious concerning me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. Did you hear the creative language in that text? You knit me together. I am fearfully and wonderfully crafted. What incredible language. What intentional language. That which is created is created by him and it is done well. It's important to note that. That God is given the credit for everything. He is the one who makes and is ultimately intimately involved in the creative process. Not only in each of us but of all things. Colossians 1.6 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. What role do the rest of us have to play in that? Nothing. It's all him. He is the creative one. Isaiah 44.24, this is what the Lord says. Your redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of what? All things. Who stretches out the heavens. Who spreads out the earth by myself. John 1, 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Or Job 12, 7 to 10. This is awesome to put us in our place when we think that somehow we are wonderful or at par with God. It says, ask the animals. They will teach you. Or the birds in the sky and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? 
In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. God is an all creative God. Everything that you can see in nature, the flowers in your backyard garden, the prairie sunsets, the ocean tides or the mountains, not in Manitoba. Each and every smile Unique fingerprint or personality was created by God and is sustained by him. It is what he does. God is a creator. God is a creator. The very first words we read in scripture, you might know this. In the beginning, God, what? Created God's omnificence is the first thing we know about him, right? And when we read the the Bible's prophetic visions of the end of days, again, we come across the creative nature of God from beginning to end. Listen to God's words in Isaiah 65 about the coming kingdom. It says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to be a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. God did create. He will create. And as evidenced by David's description of his activity in the womb, he does create. God is all creative, ever speaking life, always making things new from creating a people for himself and creating new clean hearts in those people to authoring each and every day in season. God is ever creating and can and will create goodness and godliness in our lives when we come before him, knowing and submitting to the all-creative one. May we not forget that he has done all of this. And if anything else is to be created in me or around me, it is the omnificent one who will accomplish it. David moves on to his next omni in verse 19, but you'll notice that his language changes here. Let's look at verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me too, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if I am like them, if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David moves into a time of request before God, right? The tone changes significantly here. Up until this point, David has been declaring truth about God, praising his awesomeness and his God-only characteristics. But here he shifts to request that you would slay the wicked God or God, please change my circumstances Now, quickly, as an aside, let's make note of how long into his prayer David takes before he makes his request of God. This was obviously on his mind from the beginning, but notice David praised God first. How often do we rush into our requests when we come before God? Rather than put ourselves in context Reminding ourselves in whose presence we stand. David took the time to praise God, to tell God that he knows that that he is nothing in comparison to God, that God is infinite while he is finite, that while David's understanding and capacity are limited, God is limitless. David's personal request takes up one verse out of 24 verses of monologue. Reflection time. How much of our time with God consists of us requesting versus praising? How much time do we spend putting ourselves in context 
realizing just whom we are in the presence of and just how incredible that alone is. Some food for thought. But continuing on with our omnis. David, simply by making this request, continues to speak about who God is and what God can do. And what David declares about God in this section is that God is omnipotent. Omni, all, potent, powerful. God is all powerful, David says. God can do anything. You see, that David asks God to slay the wicked implies or more strongly affirms that God can actually grant his request. Right? We don't ask things of people who cannot grant them. No one should ever ask me to fix their car or to do their hair and makeup. You don't ask people that which they can't accomplish. We ask of those whom it is within their capacity to accomplish. And it is within God's power and God's capacity to grant David's request, to change his circumstances, to slay the wicked, because God is capable of anything and everything that he so desires. Scripture is certainly clear on this throughout. Job 42.2 says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Mark 10, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Jeremiah 32, 17, ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth with your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Right? God is all powerful. And again, this is a trait we must know if we're to approach God with any confidence at all. Now, it is important for us to note that just because God can do everything doesn't mean he will do everything. But we can trust that this same God who has the power to change any circumstance is the same God who knows if that action would be best because he's omniscient. You see, God isn't just one of these things at a time. These aren't hats that he puts on. He is these things. God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnificent, and omnipotent. God's amazing. Beyond us, beyond our understanding. If you're nodding along to this message without scratching your heads at certain moments, you're likely not cluing into the magnitude of these statements or the magnitude of our God. As David starts this psalm, this is all too wonderful. It's too much for me. It's too much for me to get. And I don't know about you, but this is precisely the kind of God that I am happy to worship. One that is bigger than my understanding. Commentator Derek Kidner says about Psalm 139, he says, any small thoughts that we may have about God are magnificently transcended by this psalm. Yet, for all its height and depth, it remains intensely personal from first to last. Which is a great segue into our final omni in this psalm. God is omnibenevolent. Which means that God is all loving. God is all loving. Now, the thing with this omni is that there's no dedicated section to this. Rather, David speaks of this throughout the entire psalm. Psalm 139 oozes with the truth that God loves us. In verse 1, David starts off by saying, God knows us. He has sought us, searched us inwardly, and he has an intimate knowledge of who we really are. In fact, the language is so strong here, David uses the same word that is typically reserved to describe the way that a married couple knows one another. Right? God is, is omniscient, he's all-knowing, but not just with a, a prepositional knowledge. He knows us deeply, personally, intimately, and this is strictly because he chooses to, because he is all-benevolent. He is a loving God. As we move along in the text, verse 10 doesn't just say wherever we go, God's there. But wherever we go, God is actively leading and guiding us. This isn't a game of hide and seek which, in which God always wins. 
Even when we try to hide from God, when we want nothing to do with him, he goes with us and holds us fast, the text says. He locks us into his embrace. Right? God's presence is not passive with the ones that he loves and knows. It is always active and loving. It's the same is true for verses 14 to 18, the creation discussion, God's omnificence. God is all creative, but the way he creates us is in the most loving, intentional way, the text says, right? He knits. I don't know if you've ever knit before, but knitting, there's no, there's no such thing as a speed knitter, right? Knitting is not just a purposeless snap of the fingers. It's a detailed, loving crafting happening as God creates those made in his own image. God is all creative, not for its own sake, And he doesn't just arbitrarily create because he can. God plans and knits and crafts lovingly because it's who he is. And we see this as we continue to move through verse 19. The the cry for God to intervene is, is couched in the understanding that God doesn't just display his power as a show or a grand gesture, but that his power is connected to his hatred for evil, that which opposes him and entraps his children. His power is wielded in protection for our own good and for his glory. You see, God can do anything with his knowledge. God can do anything with his presence. God can do anything with his creativity and God can do anything with his power. He is that awesome, that set apart, that holy. And yet, as we see in this psalm, he chooses to use his omnis, his characteristics, his God abilities to love us, to be benevolent towards us. And nowhere is that more evident than what he has done on the cross using his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnificence to enact his omnibenevolence to write the most amazing true love story of all. Philippians chapter 2 unpacks this perfectly for us. Listen to what it says starting in verse 6. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, all the things that we just talked about, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. What did God do with his omnipotence, his power? He made himself nothing. Verse 7. By taking the very nature of a servant, he was made in human likeness. What did he do with his omnificence? His creative nature, he made God man. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What did he do with his omnipresence? He traveled to the grave and back. Why? Why? Because in his omniscience, he knew the ending of the story. We finish in verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? His love for us and his knowledge that some of us would choose him and could be in loving relationship with him forever was enough for God to walk the most absurd path for our sakes. What a God David writes about. What a God we can know. What a God who saves. And what a love to receive from a God who is himself love, the omnibenevolent one. 1 John 3.16 says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Church, may we see God as he is, 
above us, beyond us, wholly other than us, but amazingly with us, for us, and within us because of the cross, because of his amazing love. Today, as we close, we take the time to remember the love of God and his perfect, circum- his perfect sacrifice that we may live within that love forever. If you haven't yet at home, I encourage you to get together uh, the elements in your home, something to represent the body and blood of Christ so that you can participate with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. The band will play one more song and I encourage you to gather the elements, to pass them out, and to take a moment to reflect on the magnitude of God, how amazing he is. And then reflect on the magnitude of the act of God in giving his life as a ransom for ours. Let's do that now.